The mood is somber as people are filing into the memorial of Princess Lacey. It's inspiring to see the number of people who have arrived to celebrate a life that ended much too soon. These capital city marathoners have run thousands of miles in Boston and say nothing will stop them from heading back to the starting line. A familiar sight here on game day is a sign like this one. The bill would repeal a 1931 act banning the sale of tickets. Officials here at MSU say they'll be discussing what to do with the additional funding into the summer and hope to have those talks wrapped up by the 2014-2015 school year. What do you want? Education! What do you want it? Now! They call themselves gladiators. For nearly three days, these students walk and walk. Let's do it. Almost done. And walk. They're hoping their small steps will make a giant leap in state legislature. Joined by supporters, they're drawing attention to change the state's zero tolerance policy. Let's go. Well, the zero tolerance policy uh, should be modified because it should take out trivial suspensions for like kids getting kicked out of school uh, for not having the right ID badge or not having the proper clothing on. 16-year-old Michael Reynolds was suspended from Loyola High School for seven days for not having that student ID. Reynolds is the co-president of the Youth Voice, and he started the walk between Detroit and the Capitol building. 80 miles from Detroit, we're at last at the Capitol! Yeah! The 80-mile walk convened here on the steps of the state capitol where these students hope their message against zero tolerance policy will be addressed by state lawmakers. William Frey is a facilitator at Neutral Zone, a team center in Ann Arbor. He isn't neutral when it comes to schools instituting a zero tolerance policy. It's affecting certain students and then they, they tend to drop out more and then that, that feeds the, the prison system. You know? So the school to prison pipeline is definitely directly related to all of these situations and I think that it's really, really important that we keep that in mind when we think about these things. Pastor David Galbraith, the director of the Harriet Tubman Center, was on hand to show his support as well. These kids are rock stars. You know, they could have been doing anything. They could have been laying home playing video games, but, but they saw that there was an issue that needs to be brought to the attention of the people that can make a difference. Children in Michigan are dropping out of school. The rally got the attention of Maura Corrigan, the Michigan Director of Human Services. Director Corrigan announced she is already working with lawmakers to introduce legislation changing zero tolerance, which could be introduced as soon as May. When we were move kids from school for minor offenses, we're taking away for some of them the only stability in their lives. Education! While the efforts of these students may not be felt right away, it certainly could be said that they got the ball rolling. The country's attention returns next week to the city of Boston for its annual marathon and the site of the horrific bombings one year ago. The stories of mid-Michigan runners are chilling as they reflect on what they lived through a year ago, but also inspiring as some won't shy away from competing this month or in the future. April 15, 2013. Images of senseless violence and utter chaos burned into our memories forever. But this was last year's Boston. For some mid-Michigan runners, the day would unfold in a fashion much too close for comfort. There was just one loud boom, and then shortly after, another loud boom. Um, but my initial response was, um, it's Patriots Day. Derek Guddy, an East Lansing counselor and Iraq war veteran, had been running in his second Boston Marathon. Guddy captured this photo as he was crossing the finish line at 4 hours 7 minutes. The first bomb went off near this exact spot approximately two minutes later. Guddy says his clinical practice and military background became useful throughout a shocking situation. I identify it as very cerebral. Um, I didn't have an emotional reaction, I guess, to say of fear at that time. Gary McRae, also of East Lansing, had crossed the finish line under four hours and was on his way back to his hotel. At that point, you know, you started to hear rumors where you ran into other runners or people on the street and they said, you know, we think the, a bomb went off or, a, or bombs went off. McRae has been in six Boston marathons and has high hopes this year's race will go off without a hitch. So it was a terrible tragedy and I'm sure this year's race will be well protected and there'll be a lot of security and there's not going to, they won't have a problem. Terry Carella hits the river trail where she trains at nearly 20 miles a day in preparation for this year's Boston Marathon. The communications director at Cooley Law School and alumna of MSU, Carella has been running the marathon for a decade. 
Her experience became the subject of a recent book titled Four Hours, Nine Minutes, 43 Seconds by a Runner's World magazine editor. And the way he wanted to write it was through the eyes of the people who experienced that day. These capital city marathoners have run thousands of miles in Boston and say nothing will stop them from heading back to the starting line. We are going to go back to Boston and it's going to be bigger and better. April 21st, 2014 will be a day of tribute for those affected by last year's bombings. There's going to be people there, absolutely, they're going to be probably thinking about it. And a chance to send a simple message. Essentially dig your heels and say, I'm not going to let anyone um, scare us away. It was no ordinary day here as throngs of people gathered, hoping to catch a glimpse of the president while trying not to catch a cold. It's really rough. Yeah. Made some sense. Yeah. Wanted to see Obama. Yeah. With the president's route from the airport to campus in unknown, crowds could only speculate on where might be the best spot to watch for the presidential motorcade. But ultimately, they were able to follow the lead of Secret Service agents and police who began to put up barriers on the corner of Wilson and Bogue Streets. From patrols on the ground, to the tops of campus buildings, to even choppers overhead, security was extremely tight all day. The MSU K-9 team did their part to chip in as well. <laughs> I'm outside here as the crowd is starting to gather for the motorcade of President Obama to come on through. What do you think about President Obama's visit today? Well, we're really happy that he's here coming to campus. Uh, we're even more excited that he's acting on climate. There's a lot of provisions in the Farm Bill that support Michigan's agricultural heritage. A lot of farmers have been hurt by extreme weather patterns, and some of the emergency assistance will help protect our Great Lakes way of life. Others were not as happy, treating the president's visit as an opportunity to protest against such issues as affordable health care and unemployment. The uh, students here are having an uh, increased debt, a federal government. They have increased student loan debt and no promise of jobs when they graduate. I think he needs the answer to that. Those who toughed out the cold temps were rewarded as the presidential motorcade finally came through campus, a scene that likely happens every day somewhere becoming a lifetime memory for those on hand to witness it. It was super exciting being here. It was cold as it is. It was like a piece of history being able to see the president, like only second president to come here. So it's definitely sweet to be part of history. For Focal Point, I'm Nick Blaskowski.